you guys. I'm going to do a series of videos for you in the next couple days to better prepare you for rooster coming home. Uh, this is uh, what I refer to, this video is going to be surrounded around what I refer to as a new ritual. So, uh, most people, their ritual when they go to get their dog out of their crate is to open the door for them. The dog will burst out of the crate with excitement. Uh, typically, they'll either just run straight to a door or they might jump on the owner or try to get a greeting from the owner in a very heightened, excited state and then run to the door. And basically what that does to the dog is it, it, it takes the dog from a zero to a 10 very quickly, right? So they are very excited to go outside naturally. So without creating any form of boundaries to slow their excitement and put them in a state of mind where they're easier for us to have access to their brain, we need to start slowing the brain down and asking for things when they're in that kind of excited, exuberant state of mind. So I'm gonna walk you through the crate etiquette, the e-collar, uh, gearing up, putting the leash on, that kind of stuff, that kind of etiquette, and then doors. So it's going to be like, slow down in your crate, wait until I give you permission to come out, wait nicely for me to put your equipment on, you're going to walk to the door with me, you're going to sit at the door, give me eye contact, we're going to walk out the door together, you're going to sit again for me, and then I'll release you to go potty. So this gives the dog, right off the bat, a series of expectations. and. If I could encourage you guys to basically continue with these expectations for the duration of Rooster's life, you will notice that um, you will have a better start to every activity you, you enter with him, right? Because what you're doing is you're setting a tone. You're saying, I need you to be calmer for me, attentive to me, and willing to comply to my demands. Uh, right out right out the starting gate so you're basically teaching rooster to listen to you from the beginning instead of waiting until he's in a state of mind where he's a 10 and he's so excited that the average dog trainer can't even control because the dog is so worked up and so heightened and aroused that no one has access to their brain they're basically wild animals at that point so this is why this ritual is so important um, I'm going to go over this at the go home. We're going to have to use my doors in my house because obviously we're not going to be at your house. But um, basically, uh, even after he starts getting out of his crate ritual, you know, you really don't want to let a dog kind of run and beat you to a door, any major door. So your front door, your back door, a garage door, a door that leads into the garage where the cars are from the house. Um, car doors, any door that basically gets a dog excited and they're, because they're anticipating what's on the other side. And this goes from going outside and also coming back inside your house because both are exciting for the dog. One is, oh my gosh, the outside world is exciting. The other is, I'm going to run into this house and basically claim it. It's all mine. So, um, even long after his training, it's really a good habit to get into it with a dog, which is don't, don't beat me to the door and tell me to open it for you. You can either walk behind me or walk with me to the door. We'll, we'll, we'll walk to the door together and then you're going to sit and you're going to wait and you're not going to burst out this door and you're going to be very calm and wait for me to give you permission to go out it. This will set the tone for a lifetime <clears throat> of blocking bossiness, avoiding that conversation of open the door for me, uh, avoiding the I'm gonna bolt out the door without permission. So you can actually create a dog that doesn't leave a doorway until given permission by practicing this activity. Uh, really getting a lot of repetitions in the beginning until it becomes second nature. And then once it becomes second nature, you'll notice that uh, you don't have to work so hard to maintain it. It's just his new rule, it's just how he uh, complies to doors. So um, I'm gonna walk you through how to do that. And I just wanted you to keep in mind that when Rooster comes home, 
he is going to be either in his crate, on his place board, or in what I refer to as the here position, which is the same thing as healing. I just say here instead of heal. So when he comes home, those are gonna be, that's gonna be your level of expectation. So even coming out of the crate and walking to the doorway, he needs to maintain the heel position. This might seem tedious, but if a dog starts to program themselves by following a human around in a command all the time, or staying in a command all the time, uh, we are going to be able to have control of them everywhere, right? If they can kind of, oh, I'm free 99% of the time, and then my owner asks me to come and call it every once in a while, the dog will, will not only uh, blow off the command, but eventually might even break through and blow off the tool. So this is important. Uh, these are important steps to take to ensure that all your tools are working and, and that uh, even more importantly, the dog just starts to kind of respect you on a level without a tool that's like, okay, yeah, I get it, you've got rules, I need to calm down, I need to listen to you, um, this isn't my world, it's our world, and not, you know, I, I shouldn't be taking over and, and basically ruling your life. So that's why I do it that way. It's really strict, but I think you guys are gonna like it because it sounds like Rooster's been kind of ruling your life a little bit. So I think you're gonna actually find that this is something that at first is tedious, but in, in the end is is much easier way to manage him. So I'm gonna get started at the crate door. Uh, here's he is in his crate. Uh, I'm gonna come lift this up. I do put a crate cover over mine. Um, he's very stimulated by dogs, so anytime I walk a dog by his crate. He is, uh, you know, at the edge, fixating, all that kind of stuff. So I just put something over his crate so he could just relax and quit worrying about what I'm doing with other dogs. Um, you can do this if you want. It is very beneficial for um, keeping him calm. So if you want to do that to your crate, but uh, I just want to let you know that your crate needs to be in a room that's quiet. Right? So don't put it in a living room, don't put it in, in a space where there's going to be a lot of traffic coming in and out. Put it in a room that's quiet so he can get a lot of sleep. This guy has a lot of sleep to catch up on. So when I come to the crate, uh, I should have probably done this video at the beginning of his stay with me because he was a lot worse than this. But now, now he knows all the rules. So this video is going to be more about Look, look at what he can do. He has this level of expectation. Now it's time for you guys to follow through when you go home. So the first thing that I do when I come to the crate is I usually have a little stool and I just basically sit in front of the crate and wait for him to go into his sit. All right, so my first rule with crate etiquette is you will be in a sit before I even open the crate door. I do not tell them to sit. This is not a verbal command, I just wait. He has learned that if he sits, he will get out of the crate. So I don't have to say anything. I do not like to give commands to dogs that don't have tools on. If I cannot follow through with my command, I put myself as a disadvantage. This is what one of these scenarios looks like. I don't have a tool, so I'm not gonna tell him to sit. I'm just gonna sit here and wait. So when you go home, and let's say all you have is 20 minutes to work him. That's all you have is 20 minutes. Uh, you will set your timer when you get to his crate because this is part of his training. He needs to learn the crate threshold. And this is a mentally taxing activity for him. So it might feel like you're uh, depriving him of his extra time out of his crate, but because he's gonna have to spend so much time mentally putting, putting together that you have these same exact rules that I do, um, you are Im immediately going into school time and that's taxing on him. So you'll set your timer. This, this part of the training will be part of his time, his working session time, quiet. And you're just gonna sit here quietly and wait for him to sit. All right? and he's even giving me more because I'm rambling. He's now going into a down, which is extremely uh, respectful. But what I need from him is a sit. Now when I go to reach for this latch to open it up, because he's now in a sit, I'm going to look for a couple things from Rooster. One is that he maintains the sit. 
Any time Rooster decides to break his sit without permission, I am going to back up and stop opening the crate. Because that's what he's doing is he's anticipating and he's being pushy. So the sit isn't a temporary sit. You're going to be sitting until I invite you out of your crate. And at any point during that time period, you break your sit and stand up and get anxious about going out the crate. I'm either going to back off the crate latch or I'm going to close the crate again and start over. Right? So it's, I'm going to backtrack the steps that where he's pushy and say, ah, that doesn't get you out of the crate. Stop being pushy. He's going to go, oh, very quickly he's going to go, oh, that doesn't get me out of my crate. Okay, I'll stop doing that because he wants to get out of his crate. So we're just going to de-incentivize things that we don't like, like anticipating pushing through the door, breaking his sit by backing up, and we're going to increase the reward of getting out by continuing to move forward when he's compliant and in a sit. So that's the first thing I'm going to look for is are you breaking your sit or anticipating coming out of the crate? The second thing I'm going to look for from this guy, and this is Border Collie specific information, is he targets the latch. So he'll sit there and he'll stare at the latch. Open it. Open it. This is bossy behavior. If you can learn to actually read this in him in all aspects of his life, which might be hard for you guys, this is border collies are ki kings and queens of staring at things until they until they make the human do it. They'll stare at a ball until the human picks it up. They'll still stare, stare at a ga gate latch until they open it. This is a very manipulative technique that the mostly border collies have because they fixate on cattle and move them with their body. So they're used to fixating and using their eyes to, get in their, to tied with their body to get things to happen for them. So what he started doing for me, and he's still doing it right now, is he'll target the latch and be like, open. So what I do is I hold the latch like this and I look at him and when he gives me eye contact, I open the latch so that he's not dictating moving forward. He's looking at me going, am I doing it good? Am I doing it good? Instead of open it, open it, open it. So right there, see he's looking at me right there, so I'm going to open it. Now I'm going to, I basically right now I'm breaking it down in steps because the minute he, I open the latch, he fixates on the door again. So I, I'm opening the latch, but I'm not opening the door. Now he needs to give me eye contact again before I open the door. So that whole conversation was, you need to stay in a sit and you need to look at me. Uh, don't anticipate, don't break your sit, don't get wild and squirrely. Don't try to boss me by, by staring at the gate latch. And see what all this stuff does is calms him down. It puts him in a state of mind where he can actually sit here in his crate and wait for permission because I am basically only moving forward when I get these really nice, calm, patient behaviors from him. And if he were to do anything at this point, see he backed up, which is even more respectful. But if he were to do anything at this point that would indicate he was getting pushy, I would close the door and make him start over. So that it, a lot of your time might revolve around these steps when he first comes home. Your first few days might be the majority of this, this work. But it's so important because you can get him to this point. And, you know, I noticed when you guys pulled up in your truck, you guys he, you were basically physically having to force him from jumping out of the truck. This is psychological control. I haven't said a damn thing. So what this does for him is it gives that respect on a psychological level to say, I need to be patient and wait. I will get what I want, but it's not going to happen because I pushed my way through it. It's going to happen because I did something for my owners, right? So now he's giving me great eye contact. Come on, buddy. And I'm going to lasso him up when he comes out of this crate. You can put the leash on him in the crate if you want, if that's easier for you. I just, he comes out of this crate and you notice how I just... That's why I call it lassoing. I kind of just swoop the leash around him as he came out. Now, when he comes out of his crate, uh, he used to try to run around like crazy. But what I did is I kept my line real short like this. And I held it. 
I held it in my hand so that he only had three feet of leash to make a decision. And I didn't yank and tug and jerk and yell. Uh, I actually just stood here really, really patiently. I just stood here with the leash in my hand. And I was really calm and really, really quiet. And he basically hit the end of the leash, hit the end of the leash, hit the end of the leash like 30 times. Right? And so he realized, well, this isn't getting me anywhere. And she's not feeding into my excitement. She's not getting worked up about me being worked up, and she's not moving forward as a result of me being worked up. So this is a really intelligent dog. A lot of, a lot of what you can achieve with him is just by not allowing him to move forward and kind of standing there and waiting, because he's going to start to weigh his options. Well, if I'm not getting anywhere, what is it that you would like me to do? And so when he would calm down and he would look at me, and he would look at me and I would go, well then sit dude, just sit and relax. Let me put your equipment on and then we'll move forward. So once he's relaxed and he's stopped trying to move around a whole bunch and squirrel around, you're gonna put him in a sit and then you're gonna put your e-collar on him. Now this e-collar sits, it's very snug right now and it sits right below the ear. You see that? And I do alternate sides. I will kind of give it a little back and forth just to make sure those prongs get in there underneath all that fur. Right? And the leash, uh, when I'm doing the majority of my work, I like the leash underneath my e-collar. There are going to be some scenarios where I'm going to tell you to put it above the e-collar, but in most scenarios, the leash will be underneath the e-collar. So that's how the equipment's going to sit. Can I get this boogie out? Um, I will tell you guys one thing. Um, I, since we're recording, uh, I was putting a bark collar on him. Um, he has, I cannot put it on him anymore. One morning I woke up and he has this big gash on his neck that, you know, we're keeping really clean. It doesn't look like it's infected. It looks um, like it's healing nicely. Uh, already in just 24 hours, but, um, quiet dude. Uh, I think what he did is try to itch it off so much that he actually opened his skin up. Uh, because the marks, uh, some of the markings where it's raw, um, no dude, don't itch please, um, are actually not even where the bark collar was sitting on his uh, vocal cords. So, you know, I think you guys are aware that he itches a lot. He tries to get equipment off. So I think that's why it happened. Unfortunately, he's not no longer freaking out in his crate, which is nice. So the bark collar is no longer needed anyway. But um, I just kind of wanted to let you know we're keeping it clean. Um, but he, he, I, wanted to, I don't want you to be blindsided when he came home and be like, why is his neck like that? I'm hoping that by having this regular e-collar on, he doesn't start itching that like crazy, but I don't leave it on him in his crate. I only have it on him out of his crate, so I can kind of monitor and supervise that. Okay, so I gotta move the camera here. Um, give me a sec so that you can see me do doors. Okay. So this is one, I'm going to do two doors in this video. This is the first door, this door uh, goes out into a workshop space. And then the next door goes outside. So this door is a lot easier for him because it doesn't go outside. Let's go. So I want him to meet me at the door. All right, so you see how he's really staying with me? So when I first, when he first got here, he would go to the door like this. We're not going to be drinking water this entire session. You don't need it. So he used to come to the door like this and turn around and look at me like, are you going to open this door for me? Please let me out this door. And that is a conversation. When dogs do that, that's exactly what they're saying. I don't know, some of them aren't saying please. <laughs> some of them are like, hey, open the door. It's my door. Open it. 
But so what I want him to do is walk to the door with me like this. Beautiful. Now I want you to notice, let's go butts. I want you to notice how loose my leash is. Right? Look at all this slack. Right? Because if I walk to a door like this, look how tight that leash is. I have no idea if he's doing it or not. I'm forcing it. That's physical control. What I'm showing you is psychological control. Psychological control is where the leash could just be a, an anchor and 15 feet could be out. Here. Good. And he's still doing it. This is psychological control. So how did I get to this point? But you're being really good. You're being really good, bud. Very patient with me. So how I got there, please. Uh, rooster, please. Thank you. So how I got there is I broke down the baby steps for him. So wherever his crate is, think about where the door is that he's going to be going out and pottying, right? After I gave, gave him, put his equipment on, I took a couple steps and kind of tried to see what he was going to do. And he always took the line, right? However much of it I could give him. However much you can give him in your house without breaking things or him the leash catching on to like a side table and swooping it. You know, I don't want that. But just enough to let him make a decision so you can basically disagree with it and show him the right decision. How I disagree with the decision is I don't move forward. I don't correct them for it. They don't know what their decision needs to be. They don't know what we're looking for, right? I just de-incentivize the behavior by not moving with it. If he's pulling me along and I walk with him, I am incentivizing his behavior. I'm saying, do it. You are rewarded for it by moving forward. What I am saying is, I will not move forward when you act like that. And this is a huge commonality in all my training. I don't move forward if they're not behaving in the crate. I don't move forward if they're trying to push through a door. I don't move through a doorway if they burst through it. I don't move forward on a walk if they're in front of me. I don't continue to move forward towards the stimulation that they're fixated on. I stop a lot. Most of my training is, I don't agree with that, I'm not moving forward anymore. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna stay with me and look at me and listen and wait for the next form of information or are you gonna keep moving forward? And if you're gonna keep moving forward, I'm gonna let you a little bit because you need to play out your decision, but only to come to the fact that your decision didn't actually get you anywhere and the only thing to get you to move forward is by staying with me. And that's a trend that I play over and over and over again through my training. So if you can actually even write that down or rewatch this and then print that in your head, stop when you don't agree, give him the choice, don't cinch up your line, make sure your line is short enough so that, there's, so that safety factors are taken into account, but give him enough line to make a real decision on his own. If he makes the wrong decision, call him back to you, put him in here. If he makes the right decision, you get to keep moving forward. And I want you to test it. So I would say, let's go. Good job, Bubs. Oh, are you going to make the right choice? Good choice. Let's go. Are you going to make the right choice? Good choice. Like that. Now, he's not misbehaving. So we might have to go with, over some things. Uh, when you come here and do doors, because we're going to go do a door I haven't introduced him to yet. So he's going to be more inclined to go back to old behaviors, having his old handlers going through a new door. Yeah. I should say not his old handlers, his, his family. He's going to have his family working him through a door he's never been through. So we're going to actually be able to work through how to uh, get him to look this good when you're here for his go home. But I just, even hearing the steps and seeing the level of expectation you can get him to is still valuable, right? Okay, so the first step in door etiquette is you're gonna meet me at the door. Look how good he's doing. You're gonna meet me at the door. Hey, don't itch, don't itch. You're just making it worse. So step one, walk to the door together. Step two, sit and wait.
Step three, I'm going to start testing him with the door. So first I kind of twist the door knob and see what he does. If he stays in a sit, fantastic. I pause, make sure he's staying in a sit, open the door all the way. See, so make sure he's staying in a sit. So that's step three. I start testing. Now, you see how he bursts forward like that? It was real, real slight, but he got real anticipatory and kind of moved forward. Anytime he moves forward, let's go. I'm going to let's go out of it. Let's go. Sit. Shh. And we're going to start this process again. Door. Does the handle make you move forward? Does the door opening make you move forward? So now he's not nearly as, right? So that's step three. Step four is eye contact. I want eye contact from him. And when he looks at me, I'm going to go to step five, which is you're going to walk through this doorway with me in and here. You're not going to burst forward. You're not going to lunge out. We're actually going to walk through this doorway together. Hey, I know there's dogs around. Look at me. Here. Here. So when he first got here, he wanted to take all 15 feet of line and, and run and sprint out every doorway. Let's go. Sit. I'm going to break one more of a series of steps down for you. So wait, we have five steps with door etiquette. We have walk to the door together. We have sit. We have man manage, make sure he's staying in a sit while you toy with the door. Jiggle the handle, open the handle, open the door. Then we have eye contact. Then we have here, through the door together. So those are the five steps to door etiquette. Now let's say any time he makes a mistake, you're going to backtrack that step. Okay, so if he tries to beat you to the door, you're going to focus on, on fixing step one. You know, keep working him through it, keep calling him back into a here, or let's going him back away from the door. Right? So that you can get make sure that he understands step one thoroughly. Step two, put him in a sit. If he breaks his sit a lot because he can't sit still, you're going to let's go and move him out of it, right? Sit. Step three, the door is stuck. You're going to be testing the jiggle of the handle, testing opening the handle, testing opening the door, all these things. If he uh, at all breaks his sit, you're again going to let's go. The other thing you can also do, aside from let's go, that, that turn that I'm doing, you can also back up, let's go, and then put them into a here. Here? Good. That's another thing that you can do. So you can mix it up so that he doesn't necessarily know what command's coming next. Now, step four, eye contact. If he uh, decides that eye contact means I'm going to burst through the door, you would turn him around, sit him, and wait for eye contact again. Here, if he were to burst through the door, instead of walk in a here position with you, you would back up. So you would go like this. Let's say I say, all right, you're doing real well here, and he shoots out the door. You would come here and walk through the door together. If he bursts through the door again, you would call him back here and walk through the door and here again together. Right, so that's how you de-incentivize negative door behavior, step by step. Whatever step he fails or, or makes a mistake on, I am going to backtrack that step and make him do it again. If he fails or makes a mistake at step five, I don't need to go all the way back to step three and close the door, right? If he was successful at step three and stayed and waited and patiently gave me eye contact while I jiggled and opened and everything else, but he burst out the door at step five, 
I only need to backtrack step five because he got all the other steps correct. So that's what I wanted to break down for you, is just to make sure that you understand that. You're only backtracking the steps that he makes mistakes on. You don't, this whole, this whole door etiquette thing, you don't have to go all the way back to the crate and start all over again every single time he makes a mistake. You're just going to backtrack the step that he makes the mistake on. You're being a really good boy. Let's go. Place. So we're going to go through these steps one more time at the next door. i got to move this camera. So I just want to let you know, this is going to seem very tedious. This is a little bit harder door for me to film because this room is tiny. So you're going to notice when you come home that, uh, when you go home, that he is going to not respect your doorways, obviously. So just because he's learned this at my doorways doesn't mean it's going to translate automatically to yours. Same with the crate. So it's going to be, your it's going to be up to you guys. Uh, don't chew on that. Thank you. It's going to be up to you guys to basically, um, the whole family does this with the same level of expectations so that he can get your doorways squared away. Now, um, uh, the crate etiquette, the walking to the door, the going out the door nicely, all that stuff, that could eat up a large portion of your training sessions when he first comes home. It sure did mine. You know, the first, I don't know, three or four days he was here, I would say we worked about outside for about seven minutes because we had to spend the rest of the time working on the crate and the doors and all that. So it's a, the new ritual, this new ritual I'm putting together for you is so important. I think it actually might be more important than anything else in my training because it does set the tone and you got to get thresholds under control in order to set a tone. You have to be able to ask your dog to respectfully give you space and wait in order for them to be able to control their impulses in the outside world and listen to you. So this whole new ritual is really important to slow down and focus on and make sure all these steps look really, really pretty and clean and calm before you focus on the outside world. So if, you, if your session when he comes home of 10 of your 20 minutes, you set your timer when you go to the crate and if 10 of those 20 minutes are all based and rooted around the crate and the doors and all that, don't, you're not selling him short. Don't feel like you need to compensate. Sit. Good. Don't feel like you need to compensate. Don't feel like you need to rush outside. He can hold it. Sit. No. Come here. Don't feel like you need to rush. Don't feel like you need to get him out to potty. Don't feel like you're depriving him of anything. You are mindfully working him. He will get better at it quickly. The more you focus on these steps, the faster he'll get them so that you can move on to the next step that you, uh, you know, desire, which is probably focusing a lot more work on, on the outside world, I understand. But this is super important to focus on when he first comes home. And for the rest of his life, but you won't have to manage it like I'm breaking it down into all this tediousness because eventually this will become his new habit if you can focus on it heavily. Come here, bud. Where's he going? Come on. Come. Sit. Sit. Here. All right, so I'm walking to this door and I'm going to have a nice loose leash and I'm going to see, see how he beat me to the door. So I'm going to say, Rooster, come here. Good. Sit. So he tried it, and I let him, but I wasn't. Well, I didn't continue to walk and say, oh, oh, you want to go to the door? Okay, I'll meet you there. I stopped, called him back to me, and then we walked to the door together. All right, so, so step one, we had one little mistake. I went ahead and fixed that. Step two, he's sitting. Step three, I'm going to mess with the doorknob and the doors. You can challenge him too, you know, you can test him to see if he'll stay. That's really up in the ante, right? And I'm going to 
to get eye contact from him. This is the harder one because he likes to look at the outside wall a lot. So this one, this door is always a lot harder to get eye contact with him from. I don't say anything when I wait for eye contact. Um, I just wait and stand kind of a little bit away from him. This, it's harder to get eye contact when you're hovering over him. So I'll, I'll kind of give him a little bit of space with a nice loose leash and wait for eye contact. And I say here. And then we go out the door together. Now in your house, most of the reason why you're going to be taking them outside initially is to potty them. So when you take them outside, what you're going to do is you're going to sit him, and then you're going to say, go potty, and then you got to give him the line. So um, if he is complying to the fifth step in going out the door and here with you, um, it should be no problem at all for you to be able to sit him and then all right, now you can go potty. Good job, buddy. It's kind of a reward for all the hard work that he just did. Good job. So there's my video on uh, the new ritual when he comes home. Everyone needs to start mentally preparing themselves because anytime you go to the crate, this is what you're going to be doing. And since he will be in his crate whenever you're not working him, this will be a very, very common thing that you're going to be doing with him regularly. And this, is going to, this video is going to help you out a lot because we go over this at the go home a lot, but now you guys have a video reference to keep reminding yourselves of the expectations.